Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The COVID-19 Patient Journey Through Digital Solutions. So thank you for joining us, and thank you to the speakers, Raul Daswani from Open Government Products Singapore, and Dr. Guirong Yang from Doctor Anywhere. And thank you also to our moderator for today's session, Chris Ardesti from KPMG. Next, please. So before we start, uh, let me give you uh, a simple technical instruction. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask, please share them with us with the chat and we will answer at the end of the pre presentations. So there is also a poll that we created with two questions. So please answer and we will also show the result dur during the, the, the session. Next, please. So this webinar is part of the APACMED Digital Health Work. It's a new committee that we started a few months ago. Uh, we are working together with more than 30 member companies with two objectives. The first one is to create and share knowledge. And then the second one is to advocate for regional policies that enable digital health in the region. So we are working on several areas from cybersecurity to interoperability, reimbursement and regulatory, and more recently, COVID-19. So this is the very first webinar on COVID-19 and digital. So I'm very excited to have Raul, Guirong, and Chris with us today. So please, Chris, over to you. Great, thanks, Roberta. Thanks uh, for APAC Med and, and for our speakers and, and everyone who's joining in. First of all, congratulations on launching this important committee. I think it's a, a great initiative and also for convening this forum. I think we had something like 200 RSVPs, which just shows the, the power um, of this topic. Uh, yes, and, and I think probably like many of you, whether it's in your own company, whether it's your observations of what's happening uh, with healthcare, uh, I think kind of the digital aspect of healthcare was uh, anticipated, but perhaps an unintended consequence of the pandemic. So. I think a lot of the discussion today is around, you know, what's the current status of how we're using dig digital technologies as it pertains to the control crisis situation, but also what will this mean for the future of the healthcare industry and, and people's ability to return to work, et cetera, uh, going forward. So I think that's quite an exciting topic as we all kind of ponder what the future might look like. Uh, just myself, Chris Hardesty, so I'm the director of KPMG's healthcare and life sciences practice based here in uh, Singapore, so working with different uh, governments, hospitals, pharmaceutical, medical device companies across the Asia Pacific region on, on various uh, programs, and I thought I would just take 60 seconds to explain our view of uh, kind of the, the pandemic uh, going on. And like I mentioned, this is sort of a, a simultaneous crisis mode while also us activating what is going to be the future of health, society, uh, and economy, and, and KPMG are members of the UNESCO uh, COVID sort of uh, crisis management group, so we're involved in many different discussions, both in private sector and public sector. There are uh, a multitude of issues, unilateral, bilateral, multilateral, I've, I've listed some of them here. I'm not gonna go through all those in detail. Uh, and I'm on many of the kind of chamber calls, all, the, all this you know kind of stuff, and if I had to kind of summarize where I think uh, the main area of focus is at the moment, it's, it's basically around capacity development, right? Capacity building. And there's three aspects to this. So one is the physical capacity that we need in our healthcare system, and that includes the, the infrastructure. I mean, you see a lot of pop-up uh, facilities uh, being created, which, which is quite interesting. And also there's a lot of question around medical supply. There's a whole manpower aspect to capacity development. So you can see in Singapore, people being asked to come back and join the healthcare uh, corps and you can see uh, you know need of backfilling uh, operational aspects as well and then related to this committee and this webinar there's a whole virtual aspect of capacity development and that could be streamlining processes it can be related to you know improved uh, testing and real-time result capabilities and the whole monitoring aspect of the patient uh, journey so those are the things that we are seeing out there in the different countries and I think it resonates quite well uh, with, with what we're trying to do uh, here today so that's that. Uh, just to kind of, probably many of you have seen this this uh, picture or other similar pictures floating around there on the internet, uh, which is kind of like I said at the beginning of the call, many have discussed the digital transformation, as it's called, uh, 
whether it be in healthcare, whether it be in company operations, whether it be in public sector, uh, I think probably many can agree that it was perhaps going a bit slower in some areas than, than we would have liked. Uh, but now there's great emphasis on just completely changing the way we do everything. So uh, I think that part's quite exciting and, and we'll discuss that in great detail during this call. Uh, I guess we'll just take a moment now too. Hopefully everyone completed the poll uh, results. So maybe APAC Med team, if you just want to flash uh, those results and we can see see uh, how those turned out before we dig into the webinar here. Okay, so do you think COVID-19 will accelerate digital transformation? 97%. Uh, I look forward to the, the questions from the 3% as well. So you need to challenge us on the call today <laughs> for those who don't believe. Uh, and then secondly, where are you at with the, the stage of dealing with the, the COVID journey? So a bit of a mixed bag here. Uh, some people resolving the, the immediate needs, some people building resilience, and some people pondering what the future can look like. And I guess for most organizations, it's a bit of a, uh, probably doing trying to do all of this at the same time anyway. Um, so I think that's good, good feedback for us going into the discussion. Okay, well with that, let me bring our first speaker on. So the way we'll do this is we'll have kind of 10, 12 minute presentations from the speaker about the initiatives that they're undertaking. And then we'll have an opportunity to entertain a couple of questions from the audience related to that speaker's content. And we'll do both presentations and then we'll have plenty of time at the end as well uh, for some further discussion too. So please do continue to put your questions in the chat and, uh, and we'll address those. So with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Rahul Daswani from, uh, from the GovTech team doing some really interesting initiatives and I'll let, I'll let Rahul introduce and kind of take it from there. Over to you, Rahul. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so yeah, so I'll get started. My presentation has three parts. So the first, I'll introduce a little bit about myself and my organization, what we do. The second, I'll talk a bit broadly about what different countries and different organizations are doing to combat COVID. And the third part, I'll go specifically into some of the technology that, that myself and some of my colleagues uh, have been developing. So first part, an introduction, uh, who we are, Open Government Products. Uh, so we're a division under the Government Technology Agency of Singapore, known as GovTech, as Chris mentioned. Uh, and the whole idea is really, can we build tech for public good? So what public good challenges are we facing and what kind of technology can we build to support and, and, and better people's lives? Uh, that's the idea. Some products you may have heard of this parking app. Singapore used to use paper coupons and we've transited into a parking app, which is really simple, easy to use, no login required, and you just pay for the parking that you're, that you're using. You even get refunded uh, for, for minutes that you don't use, unlike paper, paper coupon parking. We also have a data visualization pl platform called data.gov and, and a bunch of other products. Uh, so next. Uh, so... So we be founded as experimental unit to really try out what an agile digital first agency could look like. And the whole idea is uh, to be an implementation unit too, which means any practices, policies, and ways of developing technology or other products that we find useful should be then used by the broader government, could be our agency, government technology agency, or other, other agencies to cover. And so that's the whole idea. In fact, uh, part of being agile, we've actually shifted entirely towards working on COVID-related products since January. As soon as we figured this was going to blow up, we just moved entirely. And this means uh, sacrificing some of the development plans that we had for some other products. But, you know, you have to take a call and you have to be able to prioritize quite rapidly to be able to, to move in this crisis. So that's what we're doing. Uh, next. A bit about me, I went to school, I studied mechanical engineering actually for my undergrad, uh, but then ended up deciding that I, I really liked working in the public sector, worked at McKinsey, worked for a number of different governments, including the Papua New Guinea government and the Ethiopian government on climate change and agriculture. Uh, spent the last five and a half years in the Singapore government in a bunch of different agencies. You can see there the Center for Strategic Futures, thinking what the future might look like uh, if disruptive events happen. Uh, and then the Ministry of Home Affairs, looking at domestic security and what kind of skills we should build for the future as a skill teacher. I got my master's at, at the Kennedy School in, in public policy. Uh, yep, next. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit more broadly now, the second section around what countries are doing and what we're seeing, right? And so there are three parts, and, and I call this a virtuous cycle because they really are self reinforcing. So the first part, reducing COVID cases, which all countries, of course, are interested in doing most directly, right? And so 
I think there are three elements and I'll go into these three elements and the technology a bit later in my next slide. But the three key elements are you need direct communication because there's just a lot of information flowing now and, and, be, and unlike previous pandemics when you had very clear and limited amount of channels, like now there's a lot. So how do you have this direct communication? Second is effective contact tracing. Contact tracing is crucial, not just in the pre-stage, uh, before you, you go into a lockdown, but also as you're coming out of lockdown to manage a stage progression back to the new normal. And third, efficient enforcement to make sure that people comply because uh, some people take this less seriously than others. So I'll go through these in, in more detail later. The second is the new normal. What is this going to look like? And so that was part of the reimagination uh, for those of you who answered the poll in that. And, and the answer is we don't actually know and what we're going to see is a distribution among different countries trying different things because everybody's going to try what they think is going to work for them. So as we come out of the new normal, don't expect it to be a light switch and you're going to go back to how things were. That's, that's just not going to happen. Uh, it may take years and it may not happen at all, actually, to go back to the way things were before. I mean, some of the things you, we, we might want to consider are, are there restrictions on where you might be able to go uh, so right now, for example, in some countries, essential workers are only allowed to go from home to their office and back. You're not really allowed to make detours or deviations. So that's an example. Check-ins to certain locations. Any location that might be a public, uh, a, 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 a large number of public members of the community might go to hospitals, schools. You might have check-ins to location to know who was there at what time so that you can help with contact tracing. That might be a norm. Uh, new healthcare norms. So telemedicine is one of these areas. I mean, actually, if you think about it, or Teladoc Health, which is the largest US standalone telemedicine service, had a 50% increase in service just in the week ending March 20th, just in a week. And it's adding thousands of doctors to the network. So what, what are the new things that are going to happen that are going to stick? Uh, some of them may, may not stick. So for example, people are still probably going to go back to restaurants fairly regularly and eat. But some of these other things uh, are going to stick. Less business travel, more telecommunity. And the third, third area is uh, supporting affected communities. Uh, and, and that can be done in, in a variety of ways. And what we're seeing is governments are heavily intervening in economies. And that's something new compared to the last crisis and the last recession. I mean, as of last week, governments across the world have, have announced stimulus plans amounting to $10.6 trillion dollars. Uh, which, is, which is a lot of money. It's the equivalent of eight Marshall plans. Uh, and more spending is directed to three areas. One, supporting citizens' basic needs. Uh, two, preserving jobs, so livelihoods. And third, helping businesses to survive to another day. Uh, and that's really where a lot of this, this money is directed. And the reason for that is the more that you support livelihoods and communities, then you see the cycle, right? The more the, the people become less desperate, and as a result, they won't be running around all over the place, potentially spreading COVID. So, so the more support that the governments provide, and, and I'm glad that governments recognize this, the more the cases can be reduced, and the more the, the cases can be reduced, the less we'll have to adjust to a different type of normal. Uh, so, so that's why this is, a, this is a whole cycle, and really, if each of us can do our part in, in any of these three ways, that would be really helpful to, to the entire cycle and helping us to, to combat the virus. Uh, all right, so I'll go into specifics next in uh, what, how we can achieve this and, and what we're doing in our part at, in, in GovTech and in Singapore. Uh, so the first pillar, direct communication between government and, and residents of, of their country. Uh, I'm going to talk about two products that, that, that are interlinked. Uh, so what is called Postman and what is Postman? Postman is basically a product that was developed. So we had a hackathon in, in January and that's where some of these were, were developed. Uh, the idea that citizens should be able to communicate directly with, with residents so they have a direct uh, view of, of what's going on and, and there's no time lag there. Uh, so what we developed is a mass messaging system for government to communicate. In Singapore, we have a gov.sg WhatsApp and it's now been expanded to Telegram. And so every day, what we do is there are two messages that are sent out. One in the morning that talks about the disease and precautions that are taken. So for example, uh, yesterday or the day before, we announced hey, uh, everybody, you need to wear masks as soon as you leave your house. Unless you're running or doing strenuous exercise, wear a mask as soon as you leave your house. Uh, so, so updates about the disease, how it spreads, uh, the virus, where it spreads, how it spreads, and, and, and so on, and what precautions. And in the evening, 
we provide a daily update on the number of cases. So the number of cases per day, uh, how many of those are known at, linked to current clusters, local clusters, and how many of these are, are unlinked. So you have a sense of what's going on, how many fatalities, uh, how many in ICU, how many hospitalized. So you, you get a nice snapshot every day if you subscribe to, to understand what's happening straight from the source, straight from the Ministry of Communication Information. And in fact, the Ministry of Communication and Information did a good job quite quickly using artificial intelligence and machine learning to translate these into our four national languages. So you can choose when you sign up, if you receive it in, in English, Mandarin, Malay, or Tamil, our four national languages. Uh, so you get the, the information customized to, to the language that you prefer. Uh, so, so that's one way in which we collaborated right across government. And you want to see a lot of this collaboration, ideally across government and, and also across the private sector and, and the non-profit sector. And so that's, that's a way that we've collaborated. We developed the tool, my team did, uh, but the Ministry of Communication now runs it and, and decides what the messages that are posted and using their machine learning technology to do the translation. Uh, so the second that goes hand in hand with this is go.gov.sg. And what that is, is it's a link shot. And it's like bit.ly, uh, but for, for government. And so only civil servants can create go.gov.sg links. So for example, you, you'd see go.gov.sg slash MOH, the Ministry of Health, and 6th April. And then so if you click that link, it, it, it brings you to the Ministry of Health's official page of what happened on the 6th of April, the number of cases and, and much more detail. So why does that help? So that helps because there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of fake news, whether unintentionally or, in, or intentionally. And so what this does is it allows you to combat fake news because every website that is official, that is that has information that has been put up by government can have a go.gov.sg link. So as soon as you see that link, you know that that is going to lead you to a legitimate source of information. So that's an easy way to cut out uh, a lot of the misinformation and to help people fact check by using this link. So, so we're not the only ones that created this. Actually, the US government has had go.gov.sg for, for many years now. Uh, but it's, re it's been really, really helpful. Uh, if you look at Postman, actually, after we released Postman, and we have this direct line of communication. The NHS in the UK has a very similar system that they developed uh, a few weeks after we did. So it, it's a good way for, for, for that communication to take place in a direct way. Second pillar, contact tracing. Uh, so actually a lot of countries, so some, some countries have done this really well and some countries are really, really behind. Uh, and I think the main, the main challenge with contact tracing is there's a question of privacy. Is my privacy going to be compromised? And, and people are, are naturally worried about if I give up some of these liberties, will this become the new normal uh, or not? Right? And so are there ways that you can do contact tracing without being invasive of privacy? And Trace Together uh, is an app that was developed not by my team, but by my colleagues within the government technology agency. And the whole idea is it uses Bluetooth. Your phone anyway is looking out for, for different ways to connect and different devices around it. That's how you connect to Wi-Fi automatically in different places because your phone is constantly on the lookout. So the idea is uh, can, your, can your phone then just log uh, for other phones that have also downloaded Trace Together, can they just log who the connections are? And you do this by basically um, by logging it, other people download it, and then it just detects this. It, it changes the code every 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, there's a way that says, I won't go into the technical details, but basically it keeps you private. So you don't know necessarily who the person is. You just get a token. Uh, and the token changes over a period of time, every 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, so, so, so it's not that it's identifiable. Uh, secondly, there's no location data at all. It's just Bluetooth. So it just knows the time, rough the, the time at which you, you got connected. There are different ways this can be modified. Uh, Google and Apple recently announced a partnership to be able to build their own contact tracing tool because um, the, big, the big issue with contact tracing besides privacy in, in technology is going to be adoption. So if you think about Trace Together, right? For example, it's a, it's a pairwise protocol, which basically means two people need to download it. So the, the effectiveness is only going to be the square of the number of people who download it. So for example, if, if a third of people download it, then you can imagine if, if the third of the people who interact, they have to interact with another third of the segment of the population in order for it to be a match, right? Because if I interact with the two thirds of people who haven't downloaded it, it's not going to match because they haven't downloaded the app. So there's no token exchange. So that means the effectiveness is only one third times one third, which is one ninth. 
So that's not, that's not good. And if you look at the number of, of downloads that we have, we're at a million. So, which is, which is about a, a fifth or a sixth of Singapore's population. So, we really want to escalate the adoption rate. So, it's important to know that if you develop something that is pairwise, you want to make sure the adoption rate is really goes up significantly so that you can get the maximum use of this. Uh, and, and the second thing that I'll mention about, or the, or the last thing I'll mention about contact tracing is, it's important to know that technology is not a replacement for manual contact tracing. Before we de develop Trace Together, what happened is, Basically, somebody has been diagnosed with COVID, you would have an interview with them and say, hey, tell me what you did for the last 14 days, like end to end of your days, and who did you meet? Who might be affected by this? And the contact tracing person at the Ministry of Health could ask questions like, how long we exposed this person? What is the activity? Was it strenuous? And make a good judgment call about whether the person was likely to be uh, infected or not, or at least at risk or not. Uh, and so you could do that and, and the thing is, with contact tracing technology, it's not a replacement for that because you still need to call up these people, uh, let them know what the situation is. You still need to understand the risk. So it just makes it a lot faster, uh, but you also need to supplement it and put in the work and the time to be able to interview these people who, who have COVID to supplement the, the contact tracing technologies. So, so that's something that countries need to think about, organizations need to think about. How can you help support this entire effort because it's, it's a large piece and large chunk towards also going back to the new normal. You'll want to do contact tracing effectively because once you release lockdown, it, the case won't just be at zero. So you want to be able to quickly detect who, who's going with. And then the last piece that I'll talk about is, uh, is the enforcement part. Uh, and so you want to supplement that with, with, with enforcement, physical enforcement officers going down the road, but you want to do that in a targeted and a focused way. You don't want to have all your, your, enforcers, your, your enforcers going to all the places that just, uh, they just won't work from a resourcing point of view. And so uh, how do you focus them? We developed a tool called Homer that, that's uh, live in the apps, apps, app store now. It's just gone live over the last day or so. And the whole idea is it developed from a very simple premise. It's like, hey, uh, when you're issued a stay-at-home notice, a quarantine order, are you complying or not? How do we find that out in a quick way? So it sends... Uh, it sends a message, an SMS text with, with each person who's on the quarantine order. Hey, can you click on this link to let us know where you are, share your location immediately. So your current location, not a tracker that tracks your location for extended period of time, but just your current location now. And it sends this SMS three times a day with three different links. Uh, and so what happens is you, re, you have to respond within uh, 30 to 60 minutes. And then 60 minutes after you send the SMS, the SMS is sent out. It, it gathers and sends a report to the Ministry of Health or the Immigration Authority, depending on who's asked for, for, for the enforcement. Uh, and it, it tells them who are the people who are complying, which means did you send a location within uh, five or 10 meters of where you sent the location the, yesterday or the last time that you submitted? Yes or no? And if it did, then you're complying. Uh, and so what we found in Singapore is roughly 90% of people reply. So they reply to the SMS to say, here's my location, 10% of people for technical reasons or otherwise don't reply. Uh, and out of, the, of the people who reply, actually 90% of them are within the, the, the location that they were the last time. So, so they're staying at home. So then what you can do, what that means is you can focus your attention largely on the people who either did reply at all and understand why. Is it, would they have a technical issue? Did they intentionally not reply? What's going on? And you can spend most of your time on the 10% of people who replied but said, oh, actually they, they, their location was off. So you want to understand what's going on. Is there a GPS error? Were they really out? What, what happened there? So, so you can really focus your enforcement efforts on where they want to be focused. Of course, you still want to do some spot checks to make sure people are not you know, committing fraud, like, oh, I left my phone at home, but I went out. Uh, and, and so you build in other features. So like, for example, now you, in the app, in the app version of this, not the SMS version that we released, you, you take a selfie as well. So you know that it is you who's holding the phone and you know that that's the location that you're at. So that's an example of you know, building features and how we're developing so that you can make it more and more efficient. Um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, there are going to be things that are going to be consistent. They're going to be the baseline for how we combat this. Uh, so masks and medical devices are continue to be crucial in this fight. Uh, like I said earlier, Singapore announced everybody should wear masks. In fact, uh, countries like Taiwan did this really early on and you, they, they're seeing the benefits now because the spread is really, really low. 
similarly, telemedicine and, and other infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure, is going to be critical in, in this fight. Uh, like I said earlier, telemedicine has increased by 50% in US's largest provider in a week. So how can we get that uh, more, more prevalent and, and more the new normal? Uh, and then I'll hand over to, to Gui Rong, who will actually talk more about, about this. Thank you very much. Great. Well, well, firstly, thanks, uh, Rahul. And, and yes, we'll dig into the telemedicine topic um, more deeply in, in just a minute. Um, I hope people on the, the call can appreciate someone like Rahul openly speaking kind of what are what has the government done? What's the government ambition? Because actually, it, not all countries you would find this kind of uh, model of, kind of sharing and having a, a vision. So thanks. Thanks uh, quite a bit for doing that. And just a reminder to people, if you do have questions either now or toward the end, feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, so we can take them. Uh, maybe I'll just pause and, and take a couple questions here for you, Rahul, and then we'll keep going. So uh, someone was asking if you had any statistics available on how many, uh, I guess, people or cases have actually been tracked through uh, Trace Together uh, so far. Do you, do you happen to know that offhand? So from from what I know, it, it's pretty new because it only started. Uh, we only just launched it two or three weeks ago. So I think there have only been a, been a couple of cases so far. But we would expect that number to increase in the future as, uh, as, as adoption increases and also as time goes by. And one question I had, and it's sort of related uh, to, to a couple things here in, in the chat is, you know, okay, you've got some of these apps that are in different ways, tracking what people are doing, healthcare. Otherwise, I think in some countries like Singapore, I mean, people are already kind of familiar with uh, a lot of the, the data sharing and, and being tracked and stuff. But you know, where, where do you see this all going once the kind of pandemic is over? I mean, you, you talked about new normal, but how do, how do all these kind of apps and data sets come together? What is it going to look like to be a, a person living in Singapore? Uh, so, I, I mean, so, so what I think is that there will be uh, tighter control of, uh, so, so I, I might imagine that might be kind of a check-in system, right? So where you go to different locations and they ask you to check in, you already have this now in some sense with a travel declaration form, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a travel declaration form, you have to fill it in, uh, you have to log in where you are. Um, but there isn't necessarily a, a nationwide system that aggregates all this well because the data feels a little bit different. Uh, but you could imagine that there is one that is a compiled one that helps understand. So if, if anybody is diagnosed, then you immediately know what are all the places that somebody has checked into, for example. Uh, you could also see integration of other data sets. So for example, travel data, you know that there's this 14 day, many countries have been you know, imposed this 14 day uh, stay at home notice type of quarantine if you've come into the country from, from anywhere. Uh, and, and so have we. And so then the question is, if you go to a place, uh, right now, it relies on people's honesty, right? I mean, I have, to, I have to do my travel declaration. I click, no, I haven't been anywhere. But uh, why don't we use the data that already exists now? Because um, immigration authorities would have this data. Is there a way you can check in um, using your data, but not to, not to infringe on your privacy, not to say you've been here, 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 but really to, to just say, yep, you're, you're in the clear. Your travel history really is that you haven't traveled anywhere in the last 14 days. Or like, no, nope, don't let this person in because they've actually traveled somewhere in the last 14 days. So, so I think what we're going to see is a, a, a merge of data sets in a way that, that maintains user privacy, but also that allows for a safer interaction of people in more public spaces. Great, thanks. And maybe just one, uh, one final question here and then we'll, we'll switch over and we can take some more questions at the end. So I think there's a few, few aspects here of uh, and, and I know it's a kind of passion and, and background for, for you as well, Rahul, which is, you know, international markets and, and, you know, how do you collaborate with other countries? How do you share best practices? Have, have there been some things that you're doing here in Singapore that have, that have been leveraged uh, abroad or vice versa? Yeah, you know, uh, actually, uh, the, the Trace Together team is, is honestly flooded with, with requests. And, and I'll talk about two things. So first is they've been asked by over 50 countries, actually, to share a bit more uh, about about what they're doing and how they're doing it. And they've shared quite a bit. And, and the whole idea behind GovTech and, and the whole idea behind a public good is to actually make this access, accessible as much as possible. And so we're open sourcing. Uh, Trace Together is being open sourced by, by the team right now. They've already released their second uh, batch of, of stuff that's been open sourced. So, so you can go uh, look it up, actually, and people are feel free to, feel free to, to take that and adapt it to, to their context. Uh, and we're doing the same. So the tools that I mentioned, Postman, Go, Homer, they're all going to be open sourced. Uh, right now, we're focused on building them up and making them most useful for, for our population. But uh, in parallel, we're also focusing on doing a lot of the documentation work 
so they can be useful when, when they open source uh, to, to a wider audience. So that's, that's the second thing. And I think the second thing you may see uh, Western democracy developing, uh, how are they going to learn from this? So I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, I, I might think uh, you might see a revision of the social compact that exists uh, in Western democracies. I think, I don't know, maybe I'm a, I'm a utilitarian more, more than most people, but I really think if people can see that sacrificing a little bit of privacy, not, not a huge amount, but a little bit of privacy really helps with these outcomes significantly. And I think it's going to become quite clear if it hasn't already in the next, in the next couple of weeks, you'll see that people will be like, okay, like I need to do my part and support this effort uh, because it really helps everyone else. Uh, you know, and, and that's the, the whole messaging you saw with young people. You know, young people don't go out because uh, the elderly are, are really at risk and you might spread it to them. So even if you're not worried for yourself, uh, be worried for other people who might contact you. And I think you might see something similar happen uh, with, with that. Uh, and as, as people see success, you know, they, they want to emulate that. You want to prove to your citizens that, uh, that you also can, can contain this virus well. And so you want to be able to, to do that. And, and I think the final thing on that is it'll gonna be, it's going to look different in different countries. So, for example, uh, in some countries, maybe certain nonprofits have a really, really high, uh, uh, high esteem by, by the community. And so maybe they might be the ones who, who collaborate. So, like, for example, who, who, who convene... Uh, so, for example, if you look at Bangladesh, right, BRAC is a really, really established nonprofit that really has rolled out a lot of different government programs. And so maybe they might coordinate some of the initiatives that, that Bangladesh wants to run, for example. So you might see nonprofits, I'm not sure of the private sector, just because uh, of a lot of the flag that they've received around privacy and data. Um, but maybe you might find certain companies step up to the challenge and be able to do this in a way that, that works. I mean, Google and, and, and Apple in there in the launch of, of this new tracking have said that they will ensure user privacy. So whether or not people, people uh, believe them and, and are able to put their trust in them, that is something that remains to see. But I, I'm saying it, it can be other organizations besides government that help uh, a lot of these efforts. Great. And I think some people in the chat agree with you. I don't know if they're from the 97% or the 3%, but <laughs> there are people that, that, that feel like that as well. So. Thanks again, and, and really, I hope people can appreciate how, how open you've been here with the direction of, of travel in Singapore and other countries. And, uh, you know, we'll come back and have more time for questions at the end if people want to continue to ask some things of Rahul. So thanks, Rahul. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll shift gears here a little bit. And, and one other sort of dynamic that is surrounding what Rahul is talking about and will be important for what uh, Dr. Gurong will talk about is, you know, the ability of a country to provide universal coverage, healthcare, uh, economically speaking, socially speaking, to its people. And I think you see the good and the bad now in many countries of how this has been designed and implemented over the past few decades. You know, those countries that have had a strong universal coverage program are, are able to kind of manage the situation. Those that, you know, for a long time have known that there are gaps in the health system now, this is becoming exposed. Um, so I think it's interesting. We've heard the you know perspective of the government and the kind of uh, population digital aspect, and now we'll dig a bit deeper into the, actually the the telemedicine aspect. And I, and it's a personal passion and interest of mine. I've actually felt that for the past ten years, this is kind of a disappointment of the health system because telemedicine is not necessarily new, and the technology has been around for a while, but its adoption rate was, was not what it could have been. And it, it solves so many pain points in the health system, but there are many barriers in terms of, uh, you know, personalities, politics, coverage, et cetera. But I think it's very exciting now that we see in this particular moment, things are finally taking off and, and people can see, see the benefit of it. Uh, so yeah, with that, turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Gurong. It'd be great to hear what, what was the trajectory of Dr. Anuware, where are things going now? I think we've all seen the exciting news and some of the fundraising and whatnot too. So it seems that uh, it's, it's a good time at Dr. Anywhere, but yes, please take us through yourself and, and the platform and what you guys are doing. Thank you so much for the introduction, Chris. Um, and that was a fascinating talk by Rahul. I have to say, it really opened up a lot of perspectives uh, for me. Um, so good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Yang. I'm one of the doctors from Dr. Anywhere. And uh, I'm a clinician. So today, my talk will be mainly focused on the clinician perspective of how telemedicine has come in during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just a little bit about myself. I have been working as a doctor for about seven years, and uh, I 
joined Dr. Wei anywhere about a year ago. We have had uh, tremendous growth uh, during the last uh, few months with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I personally have had, uh, we've seen a huge number of increase in telemedicine consultations, uh, similar to what Rahul uh, alluded to previously. We, uh, I have also been doing, on, on my sideline, I've been doing a Masters of Public Health, uh, which also ties in very well with this COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, uh, I am personally part of a systematic review looking at the existing evidence behind treatment as well as diagnostics of COVID-19. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so I, I just, I, I think what, what Chris mentioned was, uh, just now was very apt about how telemedicine has actually been around for a long time. Uh, every time I, I speak to other individuals about telemedicine, I always draw up this analogy of, of how telephones have evolved. So, so on the left, you've seen the original big clunky telephone that we used to have uh, that could only make calls and uh, progressed subsequently to uh, the 90s where, where Nokia was big player at the time, came out with the Nokia 3310. And that was my first phone, by the way, as a, as a young teenager. It was the first phone that I had. And, um, and in the last 10 years, similar to what the iPhone uh, has brought to the mobile technology field, uh, telemedicine has, uh, tr has grown tremendously uh, worldwide. So um, it is true that uh, telemedicine has been around for, for, for quite a few decades. I think it started off actually way back in the 1970s. There was actually pioneering doctors that made use of uh, phone technology to try each patient. Uh, in those days, of course, things were probably very rudimentary from our point of view. It was just phone calls to say, oh, perhaps you should go to see your doctor, perhaps you should go to the hospital. Um, I think the, the development that truly put telemedicine on, um, on the path that we are on right now was actually the introduction of smartphones back in the late uh, 2000s. I think it was the, the, the development of the iPhone, various smartphone players coming in. We had uh, cheap mobile data and made it very accessible to all users. And that was, that was when really things started getting kicked off. Uh, we, over the last 10 years, I think we've had many, many various telemedicine providers. And I think in 2018, Ministry of Health actually decided they had to come up with a regulatory sandbox to, to deal with these new companies that were coming up. And uh, as, part of doc, as part of Doctor Anywhere, we are a member of the telemedicine uh, sandbox community. And uh, since then, I think with this COVID-19, definitely there's been tremendous growth in, in our customer base and our usage. Uh, and I'll share a little bit more later on about what we're doing to, to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic as well as some of the things which I think may change in the future with regards to telemedicine. Yeah, so uh, I, I wanted to touch a little bit on how telemedicine has been leveraged quite extensively to use, uh, for use in the COVID-19. So I think in the initial stage, in the initial stage of the pandemic, it was uh, very widely adopted as a triaging system. Uh, so I'm sure many of, you, many of you will remember the initial stages of the pandemic uh, predominantly, if you had traveled to uh, a place like China, uh, if you had come in contact with a COVID-19 case, you were deemed as extremely high risk and uh, you, would needed, you would have needed to be swapped to be tested for, for, for COVID-19. So that, was, um, that actually made it very useful to use telemedicine because uh, just based on history alone, just based on the fact that you have traveled, just based on the fact that you have got contact with a positive case of COVID-19, you, you would have been triaged to a, to a level to say you, you, you would need to be swapped. And uh, that was the initial first bit of the pandemic when, when telemedicine really came in. Uh, subsequently, as the, as the pandemic progressed, we started to have a large number of quarantine cases. Uh, that's when the next phase of how telemedicine came in uh, came about. So as you can imagine, we, we have about, I think at this point in time, about 20 to 30,000 cases that are actually quarantined. Uh, as of last week. So these quarantine cases, uh, they do have other medical conditions. They don't just fall sick with just the usual cough and cold. They, uh, they do have other chronic diseases like diabetes, hypertension, and things like this. And uh, this is where Ministry of Health actually came uh, and approached Doctor Anywhere to help support these quarantine cases. So we are very actively involved in, in assisting the quarantine cases to manage their conditions without them actually having to see a doctor. 
So that I feel uh, was a significant change. I think over the last few weeks, we've seen more and more uh, consultations from the quarantine cases that uh, that has been around. Um, the next the next aspect of telemedicine uh, that I think would probably be familiar to most people is I think we all we all kind of aware we're living in an era where information is everywhere and very often the the most tricky bit is determining what information is reliable uh, and where the source of the information is. So over the last one or two weeks, actually, we have uh, issued out, uh, we have introduced a program to allow individuals to call into Doctor Anywhere to speak to us doctors about certain queries or questions that they have about uh, COVID-19. So I can give some examples. So uh, I personally have talked to uh, pregnant ladies who were concerned that Oh, is COVID nineteen going to affect uh, going to affect my my child? Uh, should I be taking any special precautions? Because the truth is, for the common man on the street, it is going to be very difficult to find out that kind of information yourself because you're never truly sure whether all of these medical advice is is reliable or not. So that's where we are at this point in time. I think uh, telemedicine in the COVID nineteen, we've seen these three these three aspects, which I think has has really uh, improved in, in, in terms of uh, its usability. I'm going to talk about, and I think this is where most of the audience would be very interested to find out more. I'm going to talk about where I think the future lies for the telemedicine uh, perspective, especially taking into account what we're learning from uh, COVID-19. So the first one I wanted to talk about was uh, the greater use of telemonitoring devices. So um, uh, at a at the, at the very beginning, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we very often had to see patients, uh, and most patients don't actually have much telemonitoring devices at home. At the very most, uh, most individuals usually tend to have a thermometer. But actually, the truth is, things like blood pressure monitor, uh, pulse oximetry, which measures the oxygen saturation in the bloodstream, are actually readily available in the pharmacy. Anybody can go and get it at this point in time. But um, that we are still not really seeing the uptake among uh, individuals, among the general population. And I think after COVID-19, people will start to realize, oh, if I had one of these things at home, uh, this would really benefit the telemedicine consult. And I think we will start to see more of, uh, more of these telemonitoring devices uh, for use in, a couple, in the next couple of years. Um, I just wanted to address one, one very common uh, question that people ask. And, and the question they ask is, but people are generally not used to using these telemonitoring devices at home. Uh, and I would like to point to the example of thermometers. So about 30 years ago, thermometers were the domain of professionals. You only saw them in doctor's offices, but I'm sure many of us in the audience right now, we all have a thermometer at home. So the, 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 from my point of view, telemonitoring devices, uh, like blood pressure monitors, pulse oximetries, are probably going to follow the same path. Eventually, when it starts becoming normalized, everybody's just going to have one of them at home. Um, the, the other thing I think we, uh, with COVID-19 that, that we've learned is it is important for there to be deeper integration with the existing healthcare system. The, 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 the truth on the ground is that very often doctors don't practice in silos. When I see a, a, a patient with a possible COVID-19, I would like to know, do you have any history of diabetes, do you have any history of heart disease, because that puts you at increased risk of complications related to COVID-19. And um, at this point in time, unfortunately, uh, there are still a, a, a lot of uh, patients who may not know very cl clearly their own medical history. And if we could have deeper integration with existing healthcare system where, where patients' medical data are shared within this private uh, system, I think it would really benefit uh, how the care that patient will receive in the future. And I put up here the example of this thing called the NEHR. So NEHR was actually uh, an initiative that was uh, designed by the Ministry of Health. It actually consolidated all the information from all government hospitals and all government-run polyclinics. And this has been a great help to all doctors that I think are practicing. Because very often when we see a patient, now we can, all we need to do is just assess NHR, look at what's been going on with their medical history, and very often we, we, we're very clear on what is happening. So I think in the future, 
possibly what telemedicine is going to, what's going to happen is that telemedicine may be more deeper integrated into NHR and we, I think we will see much greater benefits for patients. Uh, I just have uh, la two, two, two last uh, quick trends which I think will also come in uh, that more, become more popular in the next few years. So the first one is uh, chronic disease management. The, the, the reality is at this point in time in the telemedicine field, a lot of conditions are still very heavily involved in acute conditions. So for example, if you've got a cough, if you've got a runny nose, uh, you go, uh, that's our large group of our patients that we usually see, patients with fever, patients with certain skin conditions. But chronic disease management, actually from a clinician point of view, from a doctor's point of view, uh, actually has got very, very good characteristics that make it more uh, amenable to telemedicine. So for example, if, and I'm sure uh, many in the audience, you may uh, know someone who's got hi uh, hypertension. So the, for, let me just take the example of hypertension alone. So for example, with hypertension, if you were to go see a doctor, very often what the doctor needs to know is the blood pressure trend, how the blood pressure has been going, and whether you've got blood tests recently in the last few months to show uh, whether there's been any involvement of any other major organs. And these two things alone, uh, without actually physically examining the patient, are enough for managing high blood, uh, high blood pressure. So which is why a lot of these chronic conditions, they share very similar traits in that they don't actually need a physical examination for there to be optimal care. And I think this is where telemedicine over the next couple of years uh, will we'll really see an uptick. In fact, I think we're seeing uh, a great uptick over the last couple of weeks with the circuit breaker. Uh, a lot of patients with chronic conditions are actually using the telemedicine service to stock up on their medications, to, to, to resupply the, the needs that they have. And the last part, uh, I think uh, that I think we'll, we will see a change over the next few years, especially with COVID-19, is more specialist involvement. Uh, I, I, I speak mainly for doctor anywhere. Uh, we are predominantly a, a primary care kind of service. So mainly family physicians as well as general practitioners. But um, as, I, as I alluded to previously as well, healthcare is not a silo. There are actually a lot of uh, other individuals such as specialists, allied health professionals, your physiotherapists, your dietitian that take part in your care as well. And over the next few years, I think we will see more integration with all these various professionals within the medical community. And I think eventually this would lead to more optimal care for our patients. So I think, I think that's, where, uh, that's where I'm going to end. Uh, uh, I think over the next few years, from, especially with this COVID-19 pandemic going on, we will see a marked change in the way uh, it's going to play a part in our lives and in the medical, in the medical sector. Well, thank you, Dr. Guirong. I hope everyone enjoyed that as much as I did. Thanks for, for taking us through it and also for taking the time because I know Dr. Newer is very busy right now. Uh, also, I thought it was a, a great reminder that in the current climate, we should not be just looking at the actual number of confirmed cases, but also the many suspect and quarantine cases, right? Because that has huge implications for how the health system is going to work. So thanks for for reminding that to us as well. Uh, there have been a few things coming in through the chat, so I'll just I'll just quickly uh, ask you those and then we can go into some broader um, q and I think another area of telemedicine that often gets asked, you talk about some, some common pushback. I think another area that, that gets pushed back, you know, rightly or wrongly, is just the quality aspect of telemedicine, right? So I'm gonna combine two questions in here, which is, you know, how do you ensure that the quality of the advice being given through, the, through, the, through Dr. Newer is of high quality? and uh, kind of a technical point, but are you allowed to prescribe medication also through uh, Dr. Anywhere? Thanks. Okay, uh, so that's a great question, Chris. Uh, I think I'll answer, so let me answer the first question first. Mm. Uh, so with regards to guaranteeing a, a correct diagnosis, I, I, I usually tell uh, individuals that there are two aspects to it and we all can play a role. So the first aspect is equipment. So I think over the last few years with mobile data, with the phones and the, and the type of cameras that they have, uh, the equipment generally isn't a problem nowadays, uh, but very often it's usually things like the lighting, the ability to see certain conditions uh, by the video sometimes is lacking. The other aspect of ensuring a proper diagnosis is actually the patient uh, himself. So uh, it is going to be very helpful as patients if, uh, if they can. So 
provide a good history, if they know what kind of medications they're on, if they know their latest blood tests, if they know what are their past medical problems that they have. So I think um, even, but even with, with all that, uh, of course, there are still individuals who sometimes don't, are not really suitable for, for, for teleconsultation. For example, we do see patients with uh, high risk features uh, with issue of chest pains and and they think that, oh, you know, I don't think this is a heart attack. Uh, maybe you could just prescribe me some medications and I'll be on my way. Uh, but the truth is we, we don't do that. Uh, we do triage patients based on their symptoms. And if their symptoms are deemed high risk, we tell them, uh, I'm sorry, you will have to see a physical doctor. I, 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 wanted to, I want to emphasize that it is important for everyone to understand that telemedicine is not going to replace the physical examination. It's not going to replace you going to the doctors. Uh, I see it more as a supplementary uh, tool that's going to help improve the care of our patients. Uh, I think your next, sorry, your next question was about, uh, uh, sorry, Chris, what was the next question about? Uh, no, no, I, I think you, you, I was kind of combining some questions together, so I think you addressed that. Um, another, there, there's been a number of questions as well on, on again, I'm going to try to kind of combine things together here on uh, what I would describe as new models of care, right? So there's a, an old saying that technology just makes bad process work faster, right? So on one hand, you've got a great platform, but is the whole health system moving with you? And so there's a few questions that have come in on, um, you know, uh, community or mobile-based care are are the HCPs ready for you know this type of technology self-care devices in the home I mean these are all kind of aspects of is the whole system redesign moving in the direction with with telemedicine or yeah your comments on that please yeah so um, I think that, so that's a that's a very pertinent point that I think we're addressing I think the Ministry of Health is also trying to address that um, I would say for most doctors uh, we generally tend to prefer whatever we're used to. So definitely getting such a technology off the ground is going to meet with a little bit of resistance. And uh, so, but I think over the last, I think few months, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, there are a lot of doctors who have recognized that telemedicine has come in to be very helpful. And especially the circuit breaker. So, so let me give you an example. So previously we had a lot of doctors who said that, you know, uh, I'm not comfortable with seeing patients with hypertension over a telemedicine platform. Uh, but with the onset of Circuit Breaker, the Ministry of Health has actually made it almost, not, 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 not definitely, but almost mandatory for you to be seeing your patients via a telemedicine platform. So that kind of pushes doctors to adopt it, even if they're not really comfortable. So we are seeing that doctors are trying and say, yeah, you know, it actually really isn't that bad. Uh, very often it's just, I, I think it's just getting the first step out. And I think getting the whole healthcare system to be involved in this really takes a ministry level kind of, uh, kind of policy to, to get doctors to adopt these technologies within their practices. Mm. Yeah, and maybe just, just on the prior chat we're having, so maybe it can just be a, a yes or no, but so are you able to actually uh, prescribe medication through Doctor Anywhere or, or, or that's not allowed? Uh, oh yes, we, we do we do prescribe and they get delivered to your place. So you don't actually have to leave your house. Okay, great. Uh, and there was a question here too on the the uptake of elderly uh, people who would be using something like Doctor Newer. I don't know if you have any statistics, um, you know, handy about that, but interesting. Uh, I, I don't have any statistics off the top of my head right now, but uh, anecdotally, I definitely have seen quite a few elderly uh, patients who who use them. Generally, in the Singapore uh, in the Singapore setting, it is usually together with their uh, children or somebody who's been taking care of them. Uh, the 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 reality is that most of the elderly in Singapore are not uh, really comfortable with using a tech solution, uh, but we do definitely see a proportion of our patients who use telemedicine for their for their condition. Definitely. Uh, okay, uh, we're coming kind of toward the end here. There's one question I wanted to to ask uh, both of you guys um, because at the end of the day, digital health is still this is still about people, right? Uh, and I think Dr. Griwang, Griwang, you're a doctor who's now working for a, a digital health startup, right? And, and Rahul, I know you have a lot of experience with the government, uh, like skills future, right? Development. So, you know, out of everything we've been talking about today, you know, what what effect do you think this has on the types of skills that people need to have going into the future? 
Uh, okay, sure. Uh, perhaps I could I could go first. So um, I think over the next few years, uh, with with digital health becoming more of a, more commonplace, I think for for doctors, I think it would be an almost essential skill for most of, for most doctors to be able to use technology like telemedicine, electronic health record. Uh, unfortunately, I think even at this point in time uh, in Singapore, we, we, we do have a significant proportion of our doctors who are still using paper and pen system. So uh, over the next few years, I think uh, the ability to make use of technology and leverage on things like telemedicine will be a key essential skill uh, that we're going to see. Great. Good answer. How about you, Rahul? Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I, I think that there are three things that are going to happen. I'll be a bit more uh, specific here, right? So I, I think there are actually three silver linings and we're going to see these skills emerge much more quickly. So the first is uh, operating remotely. So organizations, many of them have had to, had to operate remotely very, very quickly. Uh, and, and we're still trying to figure all of it out and, and what works well. But uh, that's going to be great because what that means is uh, there can be more inclusive organizations and workforces, right? Because many women, uh, people who are disabled physically, people who prefer untraditional career trajectories or work hours, you could find that they would be able to much more easily work. And so organizations are figuring that part out. The second thing is the speed at which organizations can move. Actually, it's much faster than people probably thought in the past. Because we're forced to move so fast, we realize, hey, actually, uh, businesses and other organizations, uh, how can we do more with, with less resources? What are simpler, easier, cheaper ways to operate uh, that we can try out. Uh, and, and that's what you're experiencing. I mean, you're, you're seeing that telemedicine is a great example, but you're seeing that in, in other businesses as well. And I think the third thing that you're going to see in terms of skills is the innovations, especially in, in the health sector. So biotech, vaccine development, uh, even regulatory regimes and, and how those operate. Uh, those are going to be much more quick to innovate. Uh, I mean, we're trying to get a vaccine out sooner than normal in, in normal normal time frame, it would take more than a year for it to come out. And yet people are projecting that maybe we might have, have one out in a matter of months. Uh, and that's because regulatory regimes and people are willing to be flexible and agile around, around how those are managed. So, so, so as a result, what you might have is, uh, what, what I hope we have is, is more resilient, more responsive and effective organizations and, and health systems. Great. And I think one trend I've noticed is the overall health, average health literacy of the population. I think during times like these goes up, right? I mean, people become very integrated into everything going on, which, which uh, has, has positive benefits. Um, so we're, we're running out of time here. What I might ask is each of you to give just a final sentence, you know, advice out there for the 97% to the 3%. You can decide what is kind of final, one final word of wisdom or advice. I can't believe that no one asked about privacy. I think that actually shows that we've come a long way because on previous digital health related stuff, I mean, people are always asking about privacy, right? So I think finally we're starting to move a little bit more forward on, on stuff like that. But uh, maybe one final sentence from, me, from each of you guys, you know, advice, direction of travel, what do you think? I I can go first. Yeah, I, I'll give two uh, quick ones. Ah. So the first is the first is I think uh, you have to think about what are the trends that we're going to see in terms of changing industry structures and and consumer or client behavior, right? So if you look at uh, the tourism, travel, hospitality, even healthcare sectors, the businesses are going to be subject to to long term changes in individual preferences. Uh, so you might see changes in in the, the telemedicine versus physical medicine. You might see things like how people approach their own financial security. Maybe they're going to save more and spend less. What does that mean for where they're going to spend their money and how they're going to spend their money? Uh, so that's a trend to consider how it affects you and your organization. And I think the, the last thing that, that I, I'd like to, to leave you guys with is, you know, if you think about it, this is, this is the biggest global challenge we've seen since World War II, right? And, and after that conflict, there was a big question that was asked of all organizations what did you do during the war? And this question will be asked after COVID. What will you do? What, what did you do during that war? What did you do as an organization? And what do you do as people? And, uh, you know, you, you better work towards, uh, and we all better, even us, better work towards having good answers to those questions and doing as much as we can. Yeah, thank you. Well said. 
Dr. Gurung, one, one piece of advice from you? Yeah, so uh, I think my, my, my piece of advice is going to be uh, from a very clinician uh, perspective. Uh, I would just say, I think with this COVID-19, uh, we've, we've all come to realize the importance of uh, health literacy. Uh, over, the, over the last few months, I think people have known more about uh, COVID-19 than they have ever did about any of their own medical conditions. So I think I, I will urge everyone who's listening here to, to, to build on this. Um, everybody should know their own medical history. Everybody should be able to, to spew out the medications that they're taking just at the tip of the tongue. And uh, with that, I think it, then it doesn't really matter what, what kind of uh, new technology telemedicine will have. I think there will definitely be better and more optimal care for patients if patients are able to do that. Great. Well, difficult time for everyone, but I think some words of optimism there. And again, thanks to our speakers. Appreciate everyone for joining and the interaction through the chat. I think we're recording some of the questions and we'll get back to you if we weren't able to address them. Um, and congratulations once again, Tate Back Med, on launching this, this committee and convening this forum. As you can see here, we put together a little bit of a high level uh, kind of patient flow as it pertains to the pandemic situation. I think we've touched on a few different aspects today. And I, I think in future kind of forums, APAC Med will continue to to touch on different aspects as well. Um, if I could just say, I think we've been talking about digital health, we've been talking about patient or people-centric care for a long time. So now hopefully through this unfortunate situation, we can see some of these elements come together and really uh, carve out what will be the future of, of healthcare going forward. So that's my two cents. Uh, let me just turn it over to Roberta to close this out. Thanks. Yes, thanks, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Raul and Guirong, and thanks to all the participants for the great questions. Uh, so, as Chris said, we covered a little part today. There is much more to do. Uh, follow us uh, because we will organize much more in the future. And um, there is the next webinar for the Digital Health Committee is happening on May 12th. Uh, it will be on interoperability. So, uh, more details to come. Thanks, thanks everyone and have a great day.